It's interesting as we head into a, a damnable national political year, these, these torture sessions we have to endure every four years. You know, I'll give you an old quote, even an ancient quote to start. The beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name. And of course, the political process attempts to do just the opposite. It, it attempts to lie and obfuscate about everything. So when we think about why this is and why this happens and why we put up with it every four years, we have to think about propaganda which is really the, uh, the lubrication that the state uses to get, keep us all sort of appeased. And I, and I wanted to start with talking about the man who literally wrote the book, uh, a, a fascinating man. And I'm curious to wonder how many people in this room have heard of Edward Bernays? OK, quite a few hands. Now, some of you may have been at an event in Dallas we had a few years ago, and I mentioned him briefly there. But he's an absolutely fascinating character. And his personal story is something else. But the reason I pulled this quote out of his book, people used to title books a little bit more honestly. They didn't have the subtitles that go on and on. You know, you see them in the airport. Uh, but nonetheless, he just called his book Propaganda. And for many, many years, that was the term used for advertising. Advertising is, is sort of a 20th century term to make things sound a little better. But this quote of his where he talks about an invisible government and the people who really set public opinion, I thought this is, he's foreshadowing what we call the deep state today. You know, he absolutely foreshadowed it. And of course, the deep state is not just people within the regulatory state. It's also the nexus of people in NGOs and media and academia, et cetera. But I thought that was such a fascinating quote. So there's actually some parallels between Edward Bernays' life and Ludwig von Mises, uh, both born in, in, uh, in Austria, or Mises is what is now Austria. So Edward Bernays was born in Vienna in 1891. Brilliant man. Absolutely brilliant man. And you've ever heard the phrase, you know, sometimes the most effective people are the people you've never heard of? Well, this guy's one of them. So he's born in 1891 in Vienna, moves to New York City as a young boy. He proceeds to leave, live until 1995, an astonishing 103 years. And so his first job as a young man, or one of his first jobs when he got into the advertising business was in uh, working for the Woodrow Wilson administration around the time of World War I. So they set up something Orwellian sounding called the Committee on Public Information, which you can imagine what that was. And so what it was was an attempt to gin up support for the war effort. Because at the time, something like 60% of Americans had at least some degree of German ancestry. And going to war with their first cousins was not necessarily their, their number one priority in life. So we needed some support for this. So uh, he went to work creating wartime propaganda in the 1910s, and after the war was over, he actually attended the Paris Peace Conference. And a big takeaway from the Paris Peace Conference from Mr. Bernays was that, well, you know, we, need, we now need to turn to the problems of peace. That's what he called it, the problems of peace. And one of those problems was to disseminate American uh, propaganda worldwide now. You know, talk about American accomplishments. And one of the other peculiar uh, problems of peace is selling stuff. Because at the end of the day, he's an ad man. He's an advertising man. That's his job, whether he's selling war or whether he's selling dish soap. So uh, he came up with, a, with, a, with an idea for a tobacco company. Because in the 1910s, there was still a stigma attached to women smoking. That was viewed as something women who were a little more disreputable, women who were harlots, might do. They shouldn't really smoke cigarettes. Kind of a dirty male habit. Well, the problem with that is you're only selling cigarettes to half the population. Right? That's a big untapped market. This won't do. So he made a proposal to the Lucky Strike Cigarette Company, and they paid him the whopping sum of $25,000 at the time to come up with an ad campaign. And his idea was to call cigarettes torches of freedom. And he went and got his own, one of his own employees, a woman named Bertha Hunt. That's a very uh, 1910s name. We don't have too many Berthas anymore. Uh, Bertha Hunt, so he had her uh, walk out into the March 1929 Easter Parade in, in New York City. So he had her walk out in this parade, and she lit up a cigarette. And as she walked through the parade, some other women came out also smoking. And these were somewhat glamorous women, you know, in the, in the period. And so instantly, because this, this event was uh, a big public event in New York City, instantly um, a million of millions of women around the country heard about this and started rethinking their uh, thoughts about smoking. And as a result, uh, tobacco sales to women rose considerably over the next couple of decades. So it was actually successful. And so what's so interesting about this is that he was learning as he, as he went through all this. And he said, you know, 
uh, human customs, things that have been long-standing traditions, can actually be broken down by using dramatic appeal. And having uh, glamorous, well-dressed women smoking in a, in a fancy New York City parade was, was the use of dramatic appeal. And so what he understood and developed was the idea of engineering consent. We have to appeal to people's underlying motivations. You know, what really gets them on a more visceral level? And his understanding of this was something that he crafted and thought about technically, but there's some people who just get this naturally. And we all know what we're talking about in the political sphere here, right? Why does, why does Bill Clinton win? Why did Bill Clinton win? Why does AOC resonate with people? As opposed to Elizabeth Warren or Hillary. You know, why, why do some people have that emotional touch? Uh, why, you know, why does nobody want to vote for John Kasich? Well, it's because he didn't read and understand Edward Bernays. He didn't understand how you engineer consent. And so I think we're going to find out that uh, Edward Bernays' legacy lives on well past his life. And he's a fascinating guy. This is a slim volume. If any of you have interest in picking up, I recommend it. If any of you can find this first edition with the Noam Chomsky cover, uh, you might want to hold on to that one. So how do you engineer consent? How, how did Edward Bernays and how do our modern political media class go about it? Well, George Orwell understood this as well. He wrote this fantastic essay in the 1940s called Politics in the English Language. And in this essay, which you should all read, it's very brief, it's available online, it's just a, maybe a couple thousand words. He talked about the use of meaningless words. And by meaningless words, he means words that are just used so vaguely that you can craft them in, in, a, in a consciously dishonest way. And I love that term, consciously dishonest, because maybe it's subconsciously dishonest, but nonetheless dishonest. And he even back then in the 1940s said, well, you know, a word like democracy, there's no agreed definition, and it, it's just so vague. We just understand democracy as, well, that's something good. You know, that's all democracy means. You don't have to define it much beyond that. So, it's, it's interesting that democracy is still being used as a meaningless word. And George Orwell was an absolute master at language. So if you th think of Bernays as someone who set the emotional tone for stuff, uh, George Orwell was more the craftsman, the technician, actually using words and understanding how they were used. And obviously a very fine writer in his own right. So what are some of the meaningless words to which we are going to be subjected in 2020? Well, there's some oldies but goodies. I mean, there's a million of them. But you're going to hear these a lot. And one of my least favorite people on earth is Hillary Clinton. And she gushes about our sacred democracy. And after you know, coming back from the restroom, I continue reading about this. You know, democracy is just such a sham word in our country. First of all, it never appears in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, by the way. A little side note there. But you know, what's democracy? What, you know, we use it as shorthand for legitimate. We use it as shorthand for we have consent. Government has consent of the governed. Do they really? When Ronald Reagan won his uh, re-election in 1984, this is one of the biggest landslides in American history, 1984 versus the hapless Walter Mondale. Ronald Reagan proceeds to win every state in the country, and I think save for Walter Mondale's home state of Minnesota, I think if I'm correct, 1984. Okay, Ronald Reagan got 54 million votes in that election. An absolute epic lies, uh, landslide. But here's the kicker. There's, in 1984, there were 235 million Americans. He got 22% of the country. 22% of the country is an epic landslide? That equals consent of the governed? I'm not a math major, but not in my book. So what's democracy, and what's legitimate, and what's consent? Is, is Maduro, he's democratically elected, so do we support Maduro? What about Vladimir Putin? He's been elected several times, actually, in the former Soviet Union. Who else should we talk about? There's all kinds of people. Was Donald Trump democratically elected? Depends on who you ask. That's the problem with democracy. It's become an absolutely meaningless word. But there's a close cousin to democracy that we're going to hear more and more lately, which is, of course, social justice. Because these two concepts are interrelated. If a country is democratic, it can be democratic socialist, and then we can have social justice. And all of these exceedingly vague terms that nobody can define, nobody can interpret, nobody can provide a definition or a policy or anything else, well, we just need more social justice. And of course, it sounds good. It sounds like kindness or fairness. But when we can't define something, what it really means is distributive justice. 
It means equality of outcomes, not equality of opportunity. That's how people in this country use the term social justice. It is about a distributive result, not just an opportunity or some kind of fairness. And of course, Friedrich Hayek talked about the mirage of social justice. He said, you know, it's, it's so, uh, it's such a mirage, you can't, it, you can't define it, so you can't even attack it or support it coherently. And he said, justice is an attribute of individual actions, how we deal with one another. That's justice. That's why the Statue of Liberty has a, a blindfold for a reason. We're supposed to look at the, at the crime, not the person. So what social justice really means is treating people unequally. It means using state power to treat people unequally. So nobody ever says that, so therefore it's a, it's a meaningless word. And of course, the only justice that we ought to be caring about as people who, who, who believe in political liberty is the pure procedural form of justice. In other words, before the institutions of the state. Nothing more, nothing less. This is, about, this is not about outcomes. Justice is not about outcomes, per se. Uh, another word that we're going to hear a lot in 2020, we're all, we've been subjected to, of course, over the last few years with Brexit and Trump, is populism. Populist. You know, democracy's good, but populism's bad. The problem is, is that populism, from, from my perspective anyway, that is just democracy good and hard. Right? That's what populism is. And, or, or you could say populism is when the wrong person wins, a democratic election. When the right person wins, that's, that's our sacred democracy. And as an aside, I remember as an event with Tom Woods, and I was saying, you know, if just a few hundred thousand more people, actually a few tens of thousands more people in a couple of swing states had voted for Hillary Clinton instead of uh, Donald Trump, some of the states that Trump swung from Obama, just a few tens of thousands of people, maybe 30, 40,000 people out of a country of 300 odd million, if they had just voted the right way, the way we all knew that everyone was going to vote for Hillary, who was inevitable. If they just voted the right way, you know, you know what the pundits would have been saying the day after the election? They would have been saying, oh, you know, it, you know, at the end of the day, democracy works, and the American people were too smart to be conned by this uh, real estate guy who's so coarse, and he's a TV star, and everything. everyone would be talking about how the, the great wisdom of our system. But instead, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 people vote wrong, and all of a sudden, we're in an absolute calamity. You know, what kind of system is that? So populism is not all it's cracked up to be. Now, inequality, this one we're going to get. Talk about good and hard. Um, we're going to get this one good and hard for the next 12 months. And of course, it's a mirage. What does inequality mean? Tom Woods points this out. If you make $40,000 and you have the good fortune to live in the West today, you're infinitely wealthier than virtually any human being who ever walked the earth. You have hot and cold running water at your disposal. You have some kind of habitation over your head. You probably have some kind of vehicle. You probably have air conditioning, et cetera. So it, it's awfully hard to say what inequality means. And it's awfully hard to make this term or this thought stop at the US border or the border of Western developed countries. Why, why do we care about inequality only in certain geographic zones? And of course, I always wonder when you're talking to people who say inequality is the great issue of our day. It's the great problem of the West. They really believe this. They think inequality is the great problem of the West. And of course, in doing so, what they care about is only the number of zeros in your bank account, not what, how you actually live every day. And, and you know, that person who makes $40,000, provided they work in an office and drive to that office in a car, their day-to-day -day life is probably more like Bill Gates' life than unlike it, compared to someone two, two or 300 years ago when there was real inequality in the West. But here's the question, here's the magic question you have to ask the inequalists, the people who are obsessed with this issue is, okay, let's say there was a magic button you could press. And by pressing, you would immediately make the lowest 10% materially, the, the least affluent 10% of people in America, objectively better off. There's a magic button, and if you press the button, objectively, their healthcare, their housing, their food, their education will all improve by, let's say, 10%. So a 10% material improvement for the lowest 10% uh, financially in America. But by pressing the magic button, the wealthiest 1% all get 20% wealthier. Would you press the button? I sure would. I think most of you who care about people in this room would too. So this inequality narrative is designed to get us sort of on our heels, defending liberty, defending capitalism, when we should be attacking and promoting. Inequality is just a, uh, a, a word mostly for more taxes. That's what inequality means. When, people, when someone talks about inequality, get your, paper, get your checkbook out, because that's what's coming next. 
And of course, 2020, we are going to be harangued for the next 12 months over climate change. Okay, again, climate change makes inequality look like a precisely defined term. <laughs> I mean, we have no idea. For, so when someone wants to talk to you about climate change and they say, are you a climate scientist? Well, most people aren't climate scientists. Last time I checked, so the rest of us should just shut up and we should have a technocratic rule by uh, five climate scientists who don't even agree with one another. That's interesting to me. But th there's, there's four questions quickly present themselves that you should ask these people. Th the first one is, okay, do we really know what's happening because we have to look at things over eons, over thousands of years. We can't just look at them over 50 years or 100 years, 200. So is the earth really getting hotter or colder? I, I don't know, over time. The second question you have to ask, well, if it really is getting hotter or colder, is that a problem? Is that bad? Because maybe the temperate agricultural zones would just expand a little bit as we got warmer and the sea levels would rise very slowly and we'd adjust. Or, uh, you know, in, I, I, I think if you read a lot of people that say getting colder is actually a bad thing because it reduces the temperate agricultural zones, but I don't know. So that's the second question number two, is is it good or bad? The question number three is, are humans the cause of it? Okay, that's a big one. And question number four, even if one, two, and three, your answer is yes, and humans are the cause of it, are the things you're suggesting, are the trade-offs worth it? We're going to ban fossil fuels in the next 10 years? Okay, I like to drive a car. I don't know about the rest of you guys. I'm not really into walking everywhere. Um, and the idea that we're going to simply get rid of fossil fuels in 10 or 20 years would cause absolute uh, impoverishment of huge swaths of the world. And it's interesting that those of us in the West who are further along with you know, certain green technologies and solar and all this, you know, we're, gonna have, we're gonna be okay because we're gonna have other things. <laughs> but it's those poor people in China and Africa. Yeah, no fossil fuels, guys, sorry. You don't get to have a Toyota Camry, Mr. African. Who came up with that? Well, you know, inequality, I guess. <laughs> so we shouldn't get too worried, though, about the effects of propaganda in the 2020 election, if we have some faith in ourselves and in our abilities to sort of see through all of this, to see through this fog, and, and mostly it's not just about, about lying, it's also about obscuring and obfuscating, it's about boosting and promoting certain convenient facts and downplaying or ignoring certain inconvenient facts. That's, that's really how media and the political class does things. They don't always lie, they just kind of talk out the sides of their mouths. So what can we do about it? That's always the question. Whenever libertarians or liberty-minded people gather, the question is what can we do about it? And whether it's the Fed or war or propaganda or whatever. Um, and it's interesting to me that even at a time when we have more information at our disposal and our fingertips than ever before, I mean, look at this little deck of card size thing that basically has all human knowledge on it in my hand. Okay, uh, but yet we're st we almost seem like we know less. We have more information and less wisdom than ever before. So I'm not sure that the internet alone is gonna save our, our you know, younger people from this this absolute blizzard of propaganda to which we're, they're going to be subjected over the next 12 months. But, uh, you know, it, it gives us the ability to fight back. That's what this whole deck of cards does, is it is a decentralizing force in our society. And, and some of you are old enough to remember, uh, you know, you had three networks. You had Walter Cronkite after your local news. Your local news was regimented in 10-minute increments, weather, sports, etc., and that was it. And that was it. And you woke up the next day and you got your paper off the driveway. And that was it. There was no comment section. There was no pushback. Okay, now we've got a comment section. Now we've got pushback. But the first thing each and every one of us has to do in this room is realize and recognize and accept that we're in a fight. Because if you don't know you're in a fight, you're not fighting very well. We're in the narrative business or the resisting narrative business, whether we like it or not. That's just the way it is. You have to accept that and say, okay, okay, we're in a fight. So that fight, in my strong opinion, again, due to the decentralizing force of the digital technology available to us so cheap, that fight is bottom up, it's not top down. I mean, Nathaniel Brandon has this great quote where he says, you know, he's talking about your life and self-esteem, that sort of thing, but he says, no one's coming to save you. And that's absolutely true when it comes to people like us who think like we do in this room. No one's coming to save us, it's us. There is nobody. Okay, it's not, it's not Brian Stelter and Jake Tepper and Sean Hannity. 
you know, these people, these people are not friends, okay? These people don't want what's best for us. And we certainly can't count on academia. Look, look at the state of modern education, especially higher education, totally captured, entirely captured by just absolutely insane people and crazy theories, ahistorical people. So the onus is on us. We have to fight, and, and it's got to be bottom up. You know, Murray Rothbard talked about this with regard to Hayek's idea. I mentioned him earlier. Hayek's idea that, we, well, we need to uh, have sort of an intellectual vanguard, people in academia, really brilliant people who come up with the ideas of liberty and shape them and develop them, and then those ideas trickle down to people like us and people in the media who are so-called secondhand dealers in ideas. Nothing wrong with being that. Very few of us are original thinkers. And we're secondhand dealers and ideas, and we go out there and, and, and uh, promulgate what the, the academic folks give us. Well, there's not too many of the academic folks uh, in our camp these days. And, and Rothbard said, no, 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 we got to be bottom up. The information revolution, of course, he didn't live long enough to see a really flourishing internet, but the inter information revolution is bottom up. And that means that all of us in this room, we have to personally take responsibility for seeking out and finding the truth and disseminating it and spreading it to our neighbors, spreading it to our social media friends. That, that, that's on us. It's our responsibility. No one is coming to save us. And we have to do this, in my opinion, regardless of uh, necessarily the, the ideological or political stripe of the truth tellers. We just need to find truth tellers. We need to talk to them. We need to coordinate with them, and, and we need to promote them. And, you know, so not everyone's a libertarian. Not everyone thinks the same way we do, but there are truthful people out there across the spectrum. There are people like Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. There are people like Caitlin Johnstone. There are people like Matt Taibbi at Rolling Stone. Uh, there are people like Nomi Prinz, who writes from the left on, on the Fed and Goldman Sachs and central banking and treasury. There are people like Paul Craig Roberts. There are people like Kirk, Kirkpatrick Sale, who's a wonderful guy who would absolutely try to school me on those four questions about global warming. He's a huge, he's a huge believer uh, that climate change is a, is, a, is a very serious problem. But I'll certainly talk to him before I talk to Bernie Sanders or someone like that about it. And of course, we have our own truth tellers. We have people like Scott Horton. We have people like Daniel McAdams. We have people like Lou Rockwell and LouRockwell.com. So we need to be out there pushing the envelope, disseminating information because as daunting as the mainstream media is, I mean, has it ever been less respected? Has it ever been a, 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 a worse tool for the political class to control us? I mean, there's so much pushback now. It's almost unbelievable. I can't, I, I'm still amazed sometimes that they allow replies and comments on some of these, uh, on, on you know, New York Times, for example. I'm still amazed that they allow it. The Atlantic got rid of it. Any, any organization, any uh, uh, media outlet that gets rid of its comments, you know why. You, you know why, okay? But the New York Times still has them. I think Paul Krugman can write something just uh, unbelievably bad, and then 10,000 people can just take him to task for it all day. And you know, you know that guy reads them. <laughs> That's a man who needs the approval of others. <laughs> so in conclusion, let me just say a few things. Mises had this great quote. I'm gonna just read it. I know quotes aren't always that easy to digest when they're not on the screen. But he wrote this in 1947. He wrote a, a, an essay called Plan Chaos. And in some ways, it's an addendum to his great book, Socialism, from 1922. And this is what I love, because this really explains that Mises even understood that the bottom-up nature of the task before us. He says, it's not true that the masses are inherently asking for socialism. Okay, he said, the masses favor socialism because they trust the socialist propaganda of the intellectuals. Isn't that interesting? We have to be the intellectuals. We have to replace these guys. And frankly, the bar for being an intellectual has fallen, so a lot of us are, we're going to be okay there. <laughs> you know, you got, three, you got three digits in your IQ, we'll take you. Um, and he, said, he says, he's talking about the intellectuals. He says, they themselves generated the socialist ideas and indoctrinated the masses with them. This, I love this. No proletarian or son of a pro proletarian has contributed to the elaboration of the interventionist and socialist program. Their authors were all of bourgeois background. If there's anything, that's as true a statement as you'll ever hear. And that's why Marxism didn't work, because the working classes just never bought it. 
the working class has never really said, eh, that's not my economic interest. And so they disappointed the intellectual vanguards in our university, they disappointed them. So instead of coming up with class division based on income and wealth, they've, they've, re they've uh, you know, now come up with gender and, and you know, uh, all kinds of identities to replace that. So our task in closing more than anything is to refuse to use meaningless words and to force these people to apply language in, in a conscious way and in a meaningful way. And so every one of us in this room has the ability to talk about the state as a predatory force in society, not as some sort of benevolent way that we organize each other. Okay, Twitter is disabused us of that, clearly. We need to talk about the Federal Reserve as a destroyer of wealth, as something that creates instability and as a, a financer of war. That's what makes these wars possible. We need to talk about US foreign policy as something that's dangerous and destabilizing and not only makes us less safe and, and a lot more broke and in debt as a country, but also something that's going to create hatred for our kids and our grandkids from countries around the world. We need to be honest and open and talk about that. But more than anything, I think we need to be of good cheer. We need to recognize that we have opportunities just to disseminate information that would make Ludwig von Mises or Murray Rothbard absolutely astounded today. The state is absolutely, it's losing its control and its ability to control the narrative. Uh, to a million online voices today, people just like us. But we all have a responsibility in this propaganda war. And I think Nathaniel Brandon was right. No one is coming to save us. So thank you very much.